Hello, Mass. Shall we go ahead and get started? Yes, let's. Excellent. So my name is Chuck Marquardt, and I'm the owner of Red Real Estate Group at Keller Williams Larchmont. I'm also a proud member of the Greater Miracle Mile Chamber of Commerce and its Board of Directors, and we're so glad that you all took the time to join us today. Uh, we've had so many positive responses to the Zoom meetings that that uh, the uh, Meg and Chris Devlin and, and people have been putting together. And so much of it is because you're taking the time to show up and our politicians, our, our, the people who are serving us at the highest levels know that this is a great place to reach out to, to people having an impact on their community. So we just wanted to thank you for being here today. It allows us to be a better source to you when we have the numbers that we're getting. And we're so thrilled today that uh, we get to have right now, at this very moment, Representative uh, Ted Liu with the U.S. Uh, Congress. Uh, Ted Liu represents California's 33rd Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. He's serving in his third term in Congress and currently sits on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was also elected by the Democratic colleagues to serve as a co-chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. Congressman Liu is a former active duty officer in the U.S. Air Force and is currently serving as a colonel in the reserves stationed at Los Angeles Air Force Base. In Congress, he has established himself as a leader on the environment, cybersecurity, civil liberties, government ethics, and veterans. We're so glad that he's here to talk to us about a number of things. And of course, he's going to be touching on what's going on with, with uh, coronavirus. He's going to be talking about what's going on with the with the amazing and extraordinary time of change that we're in with, re with regards to the protests and uh, changes that we're going to be seeing around the country. Thank you so much for being here, uh, 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 Congressman Liu. I'm gonna just turn it over to you right now. Uh, one second, Chuck, I'm just gonna mute everybody now that I've admitted a majority of our members and then I will unmute Congressman Liu. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, some of you I've met before, some of you I'm meeting for the first time, so I'll give you a little bit of background about myself, and then I'm going to talk about uh, legislation uh, on Capitol Hill and the pandemic, and then happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, so my story is the same as yours or your parents or grandparents, or like many other Americans, I'm an immigrant, and when my parents looked at a map of America, uh, they said we're going to go to Cleveland. Uh, so that's where I grew up. And we were poor. Uh, they did not speak English well. And they went to flea markets and sold gifts and jewelry to make ends meet. Uh, over many years, they opened a gift store in a shopping mall. And my brother and I would help watch that store because we're free labor. Uh, eventually, they opened over six stores uh, in shopping malls. And in my mind, they achieved the American dream. They went from being poor to a home. Uh, they uh, opened a small business and they gave my brother and I an amazing education. Uh, he is now a doctor. My parents still remind me of, of that. Uh, it's also one reason I joined the U.S. Air Force and active duty. I believe I can never give back to America. Everything this amazing country has given to me. And it's one reason I choose to remain in the reserves. I am a colonel at the Space and Missile Systems Center in El Segundo. And it's also one reason I'm in politics, to make sure that this dream remains open for people who want to work hard and succeed. Uh, after active duty Air Force, I went into private practice. I'm also a, a recovering lawyer. I did that for about five years. I was uh, then elected to Torrance City Council, served a term, and then served about nine years in California State Legislature. And now I'm in my third term, uh, going on to six years in Congress. And I never thought we'd uh, be in the middle of a pandemic, but that's where we are right now. So Congress has passed four laws in near record time to address this pandemic. Uh, we have invested billions of dollars to try to find a cure, either through a vaccine or a drug therapy. Uh, we have uh, put out the payment protection program for loans for small businesses. We sent out stimulus checks to Americans. We provided funds to hospitals and uh, local cities and governments. And we've also mandated that testing has to be free. I think all of that was necessary and sufficient, but I think uh, it's not enough to address the scale of the crisis. That's why the House of Representatives last month passed the HEROES Act, which is another round of stimulus uh, to businesses and American families. It's before the U.S. Senate now, and hopefully we can get the Senate to act 
And my view how we get out of this pandemic is we have to uh, do testing, isolation and tracing. So we have to test people and then find out who they came in contact with, uh, if they were positive and then isolate those folks. And that's how we are able to uh, keep this uh, virus uh, relatively suppressed so that we can uh, reopen safely. And happy to answer any questions you may have and thanks so much for having me on. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna open this up to questions. If you'd like to put it in the chat, we can do that, or you can unmute yourself and I will call on you. I'll get it started off, uh, Congressman Liu. Can you tell us a little bit about what the changes in the PPP were that happened last Friday and what got signed into law? Sure, uh, so we, um, well, first of all, let me take a step back. If anyone on this call, or if you know people that have problems with the PPP, uh, please let me or my staff know and we will help you. Um, Aurelia from my staff is on this call. Uh, even though our offices are physically closed, we remain open uh, virtually. Our staff works uh, remotely and we continue to do constituent cases. And a number of our cases have to do with the PPP and dealing with the Small Business Association. We have specific liaisons to the agency and we can help you with any issues. One of the things we were hearing about is it was far too short uh, in terms of um, eight weeks uh, for folks uh, to uh, basically uh, follow the terms of the PPP. We extended it to 24 weeks. Uh, in addition, uh, we made uh, other changes to PPP. Uh, we can email you the information so you can get out to your list um, if that would be helpful. The other change we made, which was not just last week, but earlier, uh, is it turned out that some of the folks getting the PPP were large sophisticated businesses or large chains and a lot of small businesses didn't quite have the same relationships uh, with large banks and so we uh, carved out a tranche of money uh, for community uh, banks and CDFIs and that has gotten more money to uh, more uh, mom and pop stores and other small businesses. Great. Uh, I have a question. John Engel. Um, I did get the PPEs, I'm a dentist, and I started paying the money right away. Now, what's happened is, because of limitations within the county of Los Angeles to what I could do in dentistry, I will have paid the PPP money out, but I have no income coming in, and I would have been better off keeping my office on unemployment and using the PP. Uh, when I got the money, I had eight weeks, period. And so I started paying immediately as the goal was. The problem is, is the timing affects me because we're still really shut down in dentistry. We're only allowed to do emergencies. We're not allowed to use uh, aerosol. And it would have been financially better for me to have left the team on unemployment for another four to six weeks and then use the PPP money afterwards and be able to pay people because I have no income. So I actually am kind of uh, screwed in that situation because I, I have no income and yet I've paid, I've, week six of the PPE money was already paid. Right, so, so that is one reason we uh, made those changes to the PPP program. Let me see uh, if it could apply in your specific case and I'll have my staff or really reach out to you. Okay. Great, I have a question from uh, Patricia Lombard of the Larchmont Buzz. Uh, she says, I read that Congressman Liu called for an investigation into the actions of the LAPD in the recent protest at Fairfax and Third in the Fairfax District on May 30th. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, happy to. Do. Uh, so, so first of all, let me say that uh, people who loot or commit arson or assault others, uh, those are crimes that cannot be tolerated. Uh, at the same time, they're also a large number of peaceful protesters. And we saw some videos uh, in the Fairfax district, in my congressional district, uh, where it appeared that members of LAPD uh, used batons and chemical sprays and shot projectiles at really close range to people, uh, seemingly without provocation. And while some of the people were retreating, uh, they were still using batons on them. Uh, so I asked for an investigation of the police commission to look into uh, those incidents. 
uh, based on LA Times reporting, it appears that uh, 56 officers are now uh, under investigation. Uh, so we'll see what those investigations reveal. Uh, obviously, uh, without knowing the full context, we don't know what the officers were experiencing, uh, but hopefully the commission can get to the bottom of those incidents and find out if there was excessive use of force. Thank you. Uh, I did have a question about the PPP, uh, Congressman Liu. Um, it, when we investigated for the Chamber of Commerce and other California public benefit corporations, we found that uh, we are not eligible at this time. And the EIDL is also um, only taking agricultural uh, submissions right now. Can you talk to that? Oh, uh you are not eligible because of the way the statute was written or is it for other reasons based um, on your understanding that we that the ppp is not eligible for um chambers of commerce at this time oh right the yeah Heroes so Act would be yeah uh so uh so i and others have been advocating to expand the ppp to include uh, organizations like the chamber of commerce and other 501 uh, related organizations, uh, we were unable to get that uh, in, in this last change, but we keep fighting. And so we're gonna see if we can uh, expand the PPP to, to other organizations. So we're still working on that. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and I will. Rudy, I'm, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, you just need to unmute yourself, Rudy. Got it. I just wanted to clarify your answer uh, regarding the PPP funds. So are you saying now that um, if someone already has an outstanding PPP loan, they can extend, they can go back in and request an, an extended amount, not just eight weeks worth of funds, but 22 weeks? Uh, I need to look at their uh, enactment date and whether it's retroactive. Um, we will get back to you. Aurelia, if you're on, do you know the answer to that? Yes, I'm on. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And I can look into getting more clarification about that. Um, but it does say in the new, um, the new bill, it's uh, HR 7010. Um, it's specific for uh, paying back the loan. New borrowers, so I guess once it is enacted, um, have now five years instead of two years to pay the loan back if they're not able to get a certain portion forgiven. So I would have to see if the other portion of that is also extended to new borrowers. Um, and then I just want to elaborate that um, the PPP program does still have funding. And uh, the way that it was rolled out, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, so there is um, the PPP funding. I, I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, PPP funding is um, still rolled out so people can return the funds and then they can still reapply. So some we've seen some instances where some businesses haven't found that it's the right fit and uh, they aren't able to pay their employees correctly with the PPP funding, so they've returned it and then they submitted a new application. So that's still an option for those that haven't used it, but once it hits your bank account, that's day one, so you have to start using it. The, the last report we had, there was about $130 billion uh, still that could be given out um, in addition, changes were made so that instead of paying 75% to uh, personnel costs, I believe that was dropped down to 60%. Uh, so we can get all those details to you. Yeah. If, if I may, uh, I've been following that particular aspect pretty closely. And the whole point is that people didn't have enough time in that eight week period of time. And so it is retroactive is the whole point of it was to allow people who have received the PPP loan extra time to use that money. Because while you purchased it, while you got a loan for two and a half months, you had to use it in eight weeks, which I'm sure that there's some rationale to that. I can't figure it out, but they've extended it. So you can use that amount of money. People who've already received the PPP can now uh, use more time instead of just the eight weeks from the moment you received it in your bank account. And I believe that if you've already exceed, if you've gone past your eight weeks and you've spent the majority of your funds, you can't go retroactive and yeah. say, hey, I spent it all, but now I have 24 weeks. It doesn't work that way. Right. But as long as you've spent it, right, yeah. that's, that's the big thing. Because it's about the forgiveness. That's the issue, right? 
definitely. Right. So, Aurelia, if I hear you correctly, because I started using it right when I got it, like I was supposed to. Yeah. I have to stay on progress and use it up in eight weeks because that's how it was presented when I got it. You can uh, actually apportion that out, and I would encourage you to reach out to a small business development center. Uh, there's one in LA, and I can send you the information, like the call-in information. I'll also send it to Chris and Chuck and Meg uh, to get out to other chamber members. Uh, they provide pretty good advice, and they actually have webinars uh, called PPP, How to Spend It, and they'll give guidance, and if you submit that question to them, they'll, they'll, they'll show well, you. Well, I'm going to be able to, I have no problem. I'm going to spend the payroll 75% in eight weeks. I'm and the yeah. rest was rent. I've used the money. My concern was, had I known that it was going to go past a certain time, I might have not asked for it so quickly and kept everyone on unemployment because I have no money coming in after the fact. So everyone, I don't have any money to pay after the fact. So, so that's my problem. I could have kept everyone on unemployment for a couple more months and then used the money. So that's how that's the issue that I ran into particular. And, and here's the bottom line. I realized the rules were changed after the fact. I did exactly what the government wanted, and I'm proud of that. But now I may have to put people on unemployment again if I don't have money to pay them because I still can't really practice dentistry like we're supposed to in Los Angeles County. And I definitely hear your situation and I completely sympathize with it. Uh, let's connect afterwards and I'll definitely yeah. try to find a way to, to make things a little bit easier for you. Okay, thank you. Great. Chuck? Chuck, well, you have I, your hand raised? Absolutely. I do have a question uh, for the Congressman about moving forward, changing subjects from coronavirus and, and, and PPP over to the current context of the, the protests and what's going to happen now moving forward with our police departments and our military. What, uh, I'm wondering what solutions you're advocating uh, on our behalf uh, to address the concerns that brought up the protests in the first place, and of course, uh, how we can actually deal with the institutional issues that are confronting us. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm on the House Judiciary Committee and we had a hearing yesterday on police brutality. Uh, I am a co-author of the Justice and Policing Act, uh, which uh, has a number of significant reforms. Uh, it will ban choke holds. Uh, it uh, has provisions in there for training. Uh, it uh, reduces qualified immunity. Uh, it uh, has a number of transparency provisions and data collection issues uh, in there. and. It is something that we hope to get bipartisan support. There's already over 200 uh, co-authors of the legislation. So that's what we're working on uh, at the congressional level. Uh, my view is this is not an issue uh, of just a, a few bad apples. Uh, this is a systemic issue. It is institutional racism. Um, our life is precious. It also turns out uh, that black lives are subjected to much higher risk of police brutality uh, than white lives. And that's what the data shows. It shows that black Americans uh, are killed at twice the rate by police as white Americans. And when you look at the example of Minneapolis, it wasn't just one rogue cop who had his knee on George Floyd's neck. It was an additional two police officers that had their knees on his body, and then a fourth police officer that stood as a lookout. And then there was a Minneapolis uh, Police Department spokesperson who gave a completely misleading initial account of what happened. And then there are the officers and civilians who knew about Derek Chauvin's 18 misconduct claims that didn't take strong enough action. So it takes an entire village to allow this kind of systematic, persistent uh, murders of black Americans, and that's what we're trying to fix. So we have uh, this legislation in Congress. Uh, state and local uh, governments are also working on, on their own um, so ordinances and statutes. Uh, so, that, so that's where, where we are right now. Great. If you'd like to raise your hand or put it in the chat, I will call on you for the next question for Congressman Liu. Congressman, I, I do have a question. Um, can you speak to the funds have been allocated for funding a vaccine and a cure and uh, tracking for the coronavirus? Can you 
talk about where you are at right now with that? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Um, so let me give you some, some good news. So at the beginning, Congress gave billions of dollars uh, to try to find a cure for a vaccine. Uh, the administration uh, has uh, put out something they call Operation Warp Speed, uh, where uh, they're trying to work with certain companies to try to develop a vaccine in record time. And uh, I had a um, good conversation with uh, Pastor Song Xion uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so we've seen a number of promising results uh, from different companies. Um, Moderna had a good phase one trial. People in Oxford uh, have had some good results. Um, Patrick's own company uh, issued a press release recently, uh, which made a pretty compelling case for the vaccine that they're working on. And so we've got not only the best and brightest minds uh, in America working on this, we, we literally have the best and brightest minds in the entire world working on one issue, which is trying to find a vaccine. Uh, so uh, I feel hopeful we're gonna get one sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, everyone seems fairly optimistic uh, that so far the initial results all look pretty good from a variety of different companies. Great, uh, Chuck Marquardt has a question. What support is there for businesses impacted by the recent vandalism and looting? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so again, looting, vandalism, arson, uh, those are crimes. They should not be condoned or tolerated. Um, I don't know uh, in terms of how the LAPD did the response, whether uh, there are any sort of cases that can be brought saying they um, intentionally let any of this happen. I know all of us have seen images where you'd see basically looting happen uh, 10 feet in front of police officers who, who stood there. Um, my understanding is they were under orders not to engage. Um, it's an open question is, you know, was that a good idea, bad idea? I don't understand police tactics enough to, to have an opinion. Um, now, whether uh, businesses can, can sue on that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how insurance uh, relates uh, to this either. Uh, the LA City Council, LA County would probably be the best places to see if they're thinking of putting out any funds uh, to help businesses that were affected uh, by uh, their protests. I have a question to ask on top of that. Uh, what is, okay, what I'm hearing in the, the US world is that in general, insurance companies are denying any claims for office overhead interruption, even though the government shut us down. And insurance companies are saying, well, it wasn't because a pipe broke or it wasn't because of this. They're refusing to pay for uh, office overhead interruption. Is, is the government looking at trying to get the insurance companies to actually honor something for the public that they've been getting premiums forever on and never paying off on when it's clear we had no choice. Yes, so uh, a few weeks ago, I signed on to a letter uh, led by Representative Thompson uh, in Northern California to the California Insurance Commissioner asking him to look into this exact issue and to use any authority he has to get insurance companies uh, to pay claims that they, um, should pay unless it's expressly denied uh, in their policies. Uh, in Congress, we're looking at legislation to address this very issue. Uh, none of that legislation has moved yet, um, but I'm uh, happy to send you uh, what some of those bills are. Uh, Carolyn Maloney out of New York has one such bill. Um, uh, I have a question. Should I, I haven't filed a claim because I thought it would be denied. Should I file a claim just to be grandfathered in or it doesn't matter at this point? I'm not sure that would matter at this point. Um, if your insurance policy has pretty clear language, um, then I don't think it matters whether you file it now or file it later. Okay. If it's ambiguous, I would file it now. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else have a question? Oh, I got two more. Chat window is clear. Does anybody else have a question if you would raise your hand or electronically raise your hand for Congressman Liu? Uh, Stephen Kramer. I, I just w wanted to respond to John Engel. File the claim. 
Okay. All they can do is deny it, but go ahead and file it. Okay. End of speech. All right, I did have uh, one last question for Congressman Liu, and that is um, California relies on the production industry uh, a great deal. Is there anything that is happening on the federal level to get that back into motion or regulations that would ensure that being a safe place for production people to work in? Yes, uh, and this is also related to the insurance issue. A number uh, of productions uh, have difficulty happening because they can't get insurance uh, if that production were interrupted uh, under the current state of affairs. So uh, we're working on that issue uh, in Congress to see if there's a, a federal legislative fix. Um, it, might, uh, it might require federal funding the same way that we had uh, put in federal backstops after 9-11. Uh, for some of these insurance companies. So that's where, where um, I, well, if we go that route, we, we could fix this issue for a, a number of folks in the entertainment industry. Uh, but we're working to see if there are other ways to do it. If not, my view is we should, we should go that route. So uh, so answer is yes, we're, we're working on that issue. Thank you. All right. Congressman Liu, we are so thankful that you took the time to be with us today and to open yourself up to 20 minutes of, of questions where you're not getting to Wow, I'm still here. Nothing bad happened. <laughs> so, but thank you for opening yourself up to those questions. And let's uh, just someone over, take over for a second. All right. Thank you so much, Congressman Liu. If uh, you would like to stay on the call, you're very welcome to. Um, if not, we, we appreciate your time and we know that you have so much to do. So uh, if you need to get back to business, you can do that as well. Yeah. Thank so, you so, so much going, for your time. Uh, but let me just conclude um, by saying that uh, despite what you see in the media, there has been unprecedented cooperation uh, on a bipartisan basis, as well as among local, state, and federal officials. Uh, to address this pandemic. Um, I've written uh, two letters to White House Coronavirus Task Force led by Vice President Mike Pence. And each of those two letters, the first two words were the same, uh, which were thank you. Uh, and so you do see, um, uh, this is what we see on TV, uh, at the actual execution level, uh, everyone working together trying to help businesses, American families, uh, and uh, those who are being affected by this pandemic. And that's going to continue. And my view is at the end of the day, uh, we're all Americans. Uh, thank you uh, for being on this call and look forward to continuing working with you. Thank you for your service. Thank you so thank much. You. Technical difficulties with a new camera. Apparently it's not attached very well. Anyways, thank you everyone for being on. We've got, I see we've got so many more wonderful people on right now. Hi, Karen. Good to see you. Elka, glad you're here. Joyce, always a pleasure to see everybody. So what I'd like to do right now is to introduce our next presenter. Uh, Los Angeles City Attorney Mike Fuhrer has long been one of California's leading lawyers and lawmakers, having represented the Miracle Mile in the State Assembly and on the LA City Council. Currently, his office has been especially active in responding to the COVID-19 crisis, fighting a wide range of false or misleading claims about test kits, preventions and cures, going after price gouging, enforcing the safer at home order regarding non-essential businesses, raising awareness of hate incidents targeting the API community and protecting uh, domestic violence victims trapped with their abuser through the behind closed doors collaboration with grocers and LAUSD. By the way, I'm, that's, a, that's a big uh, big point for me. I'm so happy that you're doing that. Everyone, please welcome uh, uh, Los Angeles City Attorney Mike Fuhrer. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. Uh, I, I miss seeing you at the museum. And Ted and I just did a version of this for the Anti-Defamation League. So here we are again. Um, and I appreciate Ted's service and always enjoy our collaboration. Uh, it is, again, at, you know, I've been working with uh, you all since I was on the city council in the 1990s. And it's a pleasure to be here today. So I'm going to talk, I guess we have in mind that I would speak for maybe 10, 15 minutes and then take questions. Is that about right? Very good. Okay. 
so um, first, I do want you, in case you were wondering, to know that I am wearing pants uh, as I sit here. And um, uh, I want to talk about the, the severity of the moment that we find ourselves. You know, at this time, we're experiencing here in Los Angeles uh, the collision of a number of crises simultaneously, right? So we have the public health emergency caused by the pandemic. We have the cratering of the economy precipitated by that pandemic. We have the emergence of a call for racial justice on a level we have not heard for years that I hope is sustainable. And our neighborhood experienced some acts of violence that have devastated businesses there. All this on top of homelessness and climate change and other major issues. So this is a time when all of us have to rise to the challenge. Um, I want to begin by just elaborating a little bit on what was referred to in the introduction uh, about our work in the COVID space. So when the pandemic emerged, my instruction to our team was to focus on the intersection between public health and consumer protection. And we've done that in a way that, as far as I know, leads the nation. Uh, first, we were focused on the issue of false and misleading claims on the internet that might adversely affect people's health. We zeroed in on the sales of test kits, uh, home test kits that were not approved by the FDA. And you've seen us again and again and again bring lawsuits and stop practices that would otherwise have led people to get kits which could have created false negatives, leading people to infect others in their community, senior citizens, elderly relatives, and others or false positives, which create tremendous anxiety and have other problems associated with them. And you should know that in uh, one of these cases, the Department of Defense reached out to us because of the quality of our work and it comes to their attention. We're part of a, a Justice Department task force with the U.S. Attorney and other federal agencies focused on this issue. I'm extremely proud of that work. And it transcended false, um, uh, you know, falsely advertised uh, test kits. It went into disinfectant that we've alleged it will not do the job it's advertised to do. And then we segued into radish paste as an alleged preventative or cure. And then we focused on vitamins, um, which were not substantiated by the FDA to be a way to prevent or cure COVID. Um, and then we went after the uh, Jim Baker and the Jim Baker show for selling an item, an advertising item called Silver Solution, um, which I, we called on them to substantiate their claims about Silver Solution. Uh, Baker and the Baker show just sued me and other leaders in law enforcement around the United States uh, to try to get us to stop uh, asking questions about whether there's anything to these claims. Um, uh, and other issues. Then we focused on price gouging. You know, price gouging is particularly horrific in a situation where people are filled with anxiety and desperate for basic goods and services. And we, again, been leaders in this area. We formed a task force with the DA and the LA County Department of Business and Consumer Affairs and County Council. And we've been going after instances of price gouging. I actually got a question from a reporter not long ago about why our office has done so much work in this area compared to others. I'm very proud of that work. And then we had to enforce the safer at home order, uh, which meant assuring that non-essential businesses were honoring that order in a way that, you know, from my standpoint, I am extremely empathetic with the need of small business in particular to get on its feet. Uh, there are bills to pay. There are employees who rely on businesses for their livelihoods and every day those businesses were shut down is a day that jeopardized what could have been decades worth of work. But all of us need to adhere to the rules that public health uh, officials identify as crucial for all of us to return to work as soon as possible. So our team first was deployed in a way that I wanted to do education first. And so our office made more than 1,800 phone calls to businesses designed to educate them about their obligations to prevent there from being any further steps necessary, just comply voluntarily with the order. 
but we've also prosecuted in instances where that worked in wasn't successful and the LAPD came out and warned and still the businesses remained open. And so we have prosecutions pending in about five dozen instances. We also defended that order when activists for guns uh, were trying to create exceptions for gun stores in this moment. And then we've been doing other work you identified. For example, when you are a domestic violence victim, you are trapped now at home with your abuser. And we're very concerned about the fact that there was a reduction since the pandemic first began in reports of domestic abuse and concerned that that was not because there weren't fewer instances of abuse, but instead because people were reluctant to enforce, I mean, to, to report on it. And so we created with the LAUSD and the DA and the Grocers Association a campaign called Behind Closed Doors, where we created a, a set of documents, information that could easily be distributed at grocery stores and through LAUSD food distribution centers, because we thought those were areas where if you're a victim of domestic violence, you are at least going to be going to get food. And we wanted you to know, for example, that you don't have to call 911, you can text 911. We wanted you to know that there are services and shelters available even during the pandemic. We wanted people to know that there was someone there for them. And interestingly, I cannot claim that there was cause and effect here, but in the week after we began publicizing behind closed doors on TV, on the radio, and the media, domestic violence calls began to go up. Uh, so I'm hopeful it was effective. Then we were very concerned about the issue of the use of vocabulary in this pandemic that could be putting people at risk. In particular, whenever I hear the president or the members of administration use the word Chinese flu or words to that effect, I know the impact it's having because there's been a dramatic increase in hate incidents around the United States after that vocabulary was invoked against the API community. And so we held a virtual summit on the issue of hate incidents and the Asian American community because I wanted people to be very, very able to report these incidents. I wanted folks to know that there will be follow-up when those, that reporting takes place. I wanted to deter people from engaging in hate incidents because they would know there'd be that follow-up. And I wanted the Asian American communities of our area to know that we stand with them. So those are just some of the responses we took to the COVID crisis. Now I want to segue into another of the major crises I referred to, and that is the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. And that murder obviously has touched every corner of the country. It's touched street corners here in Los Angeles. There are members of our community right now who are people of color wondering if they will be next. And of course, we cannot allow that to happen. We have worked very hard in Los Angeles to deepen bonds between LAPD and the communities the department serves, and that work is very important. We've been working, and our office has been at the cutting edge of this, to create alternatives to the traditional justice system for low-level crimes to reduce incarceration and turn people's lives around. We have made progress, but that progress has been imperfect, and we need to hear the protesters when they say, not enough progress. And you continue to see from our office efforts to assure that that progress actually moves forward. We can talk more about that. And I want to address a third element of the crises that I described, and that is the decimation of the economy and the impact on small business in particular. If you watch TV this week, you know that I'm about to convene a series of virtual town halls, including with business community leaders small businesses in particular, and I invite you all to join when we convene those hearings, those discussions, because I have in mind a conversation that doesn't just take us back to normal, whatever that means. We can be better than that. I want to see us take a leading role in working together to create a next version of Los Angeles that is stronger and more resilient and more hopeful and more equitable. And can I say, I saw the beginnings of what that kind of Los Angeles might look like in our neighborhood about a week and a half ago. You know, I live in the Fairfax neighborhood, as you know. And the day after the both the peaceful protest and its aftermath, I awoke early. It was Sunday, about a week and a half ago. 
And my, I was thinking actually before dawn that what I was going to do was create a program with my office in the lead to help the businesses that had been creamed in the aftermath of the protests to pick up the pieces. And I took a walk in the neighborhood early that morning. And it turned out I did not need to convene anything because as many of you probably know, our neighbors with brooms and dustpans were going to stores whose owners they never met before just to lend a hand to pick up shattered glass and to help pick up shattered lives too. Because I saw um, at one store, our neighbors consoling a business owner who they did not know clearly, who was sobbing in her store. She had lost everything. The window was shattered. Almost all her merchandise was gone. And our neighbors were doing one thing. They were saying, we are one community and we're in this together because that's what neighbors do. They didn't need anybody to organize them. They did that on their own. And in those moments, I'm going to invoke words I used a moment ago. I saw a more hopeful, resilient city where people stand up for each other. And that's the city that we are all engaged, all of us, whether we're elected or not, in leading moving forward. So I want to invite you. I'm going to conclude with that. I want to invite you when we convene these virtual town halls about creating a renewed, better Los Angeles. I want to invite you to participate in that and ideally provide specific antidotes to where we are. I want to know what does it look like beyond lip service to really mean we want to lift up small businesses? Is it access to capital? Is it job retraining? Is it mentorship? What is it exactly? Is it regulatory change? How are we going to work together so that the next iteration of our city is better than ever? So if that's okay, I'd like to conclude with those remarks, and then I'm eager to take your questions. And thanks for what you do, by the way. I hope you're all well and happy and healthy and safe. Thank you, Mike. I do have a couple of questions, one from Lenore, and then John Engel has a question right after that. Uh, sure. From Lenore, uh, please address Mayor Garcetti's proposal to reduce the police budget by $150 million. Wouldn't it be better to increase their budget to make reforms within the police department? So these are very, very important questions. You know, I used to be the chair of the budget in the city council back in the 1990s, 2000, but I don't have that role now, so I'll, I, <clears throat> I don't have a vote, but I'll give you some thoughts. <clears throat> First thought is, uh, in general terms, and this is, I, I think that Mayor Garcetti also agrees with me on this point, the term <clears throat> defund the police has become popular across the country. I do not use that terminology, and I don't support defunding the police. I do support rethinking how we police, and I do support rethinking what we mean when we say these are the ingredients necessary for public safety, to have a safe community. As you probably know, if you remember my work on the city council and the state legislature, as well as my work now as city attorney, you know that I have been a staunch advocate for reforming the police department and for community policing. And I've put action behind those words, not only on the council, but even as city attorney, because our neighborhood prosecutor program is very thematically closely tied to the idea of a community-based policing and prosecutorial system where we're working together in neighborhoods to solve the problems that are most important. When it comes to our funding, there is no question in my mind that there needs to be a deeper investment of resources, private and public, in neighborhoods of our city that have for too long been ignored. I've been saying that for years and acting on that in my previous roles. But more needs to be invested in public health, in public education, in assuring kids have recreational opportunities and in grocery stores and healthy food available, in assuring that people have to, uh, kids have stuff to do after school and summer jobs. And you know, as, as you know, I have funded a lot of those activities in my prior work. As far as the police budget is concerned, just so you know, given the severity of the economic crisis, my office is about to take a very severe cut. Uh, the proposal is that the staffing in my office, personnel time is reduced by 18.6% in this coming year. And we're all taking pay cuts. So every, I think every department in the city needs to be examined in that same way. Some departments were immune from those cuts. I think all departments should be looked at with care. 
as to what level of budget the police department which have which should have i don't know that a particular number is the right number and i want to know what the impact on public safety is of that diminution i also by the way theory, I, I, at 10,000 feet i agree with the point that one thing that we all want is more community policing so we police are not just driving by in cars and an occupying force in a neighborhood, police need to be on the street. So as the council debates what public safety looks like and what the budget ought to be, I hope it takes in, into account each of the points that I just made. Next question. Thank you. Uh, John Engel. Hey, John. Unmute myself here. Okay. Mike, thank you for your service. Uh, you personally, how you handled things kind of made me believe in politicians again on the local level. So I, I, I appreciate all you do. I feel like we've sent a mixed message on um, price gouging because the city went after the food delivery services and nothing has been done about PPEs across the city, whether it be for providers, healthcare providers, or even in the stores, uh, the insane cost of a box of masks, of hand sanitizers, versus all the, I mean, for me, a gown to go, a disposable gown from 60 cents to $9, $10. Besides having untenable costs to the public, because someone's going to have to pay for it, it's, uh, it's unre it's, it seems like that has been ignored in everything. And uh, wondering how you... And, and the other side of it is, and this is a side I hate, is that they're all disposable. It's going to screw up our, our water, our oceans. We have more disposables instead of reusing. So they're double-edged swords. And we won't get into the science because that's way beyond our stuff. But I'm just concerned that the public hasn't been protected in the biggest area, which is PPEs. So great question. Let me walk through what our office is doing. So. On price gouging, we were, we've been focused both online and in brick and mortar stores. Online, early on, we did something very unusual. We developed a collaboration with Amazon because price gouging, as you probably know, is defined by state law as an, a seller offering an item for more than 10% more than it was offered before the emergency was declared. Establishing that, required two things that we did not easily have in combating online price gouging. One, the identity of the third party seller, which is not always transparent on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And two, what they were selling the good for before the emergency. Amazon provided us with both. And so we have again and again filed price gouging cases that are pending now. I'll give you one example. Uh, a seller allegedly selling a package of 10 masks for more than $200. Um, another seller sent, selling a, pack, a container, two containers of hand sanitizer, a couple liters, for more than $200. Uh, so in those instances and others, we are actually going after price gouging for precisely the things you're talking about, hand sanitizer, masks, and so forth. In brick and mortar stores, we have sent, submitted dozens, I think almost 80 now, cease and desist letters that LAPD has been serving on brick and mortar businesses throughout our community, focused on the kinds of goods you're talking about and others too, uh, and getting compliance once those cease and desist letters have been served. And we're continuing to get other referrals for cases. Now, you, to, I'm gonna distinguish that from, you mentioned the um, delivery services. That was not our work and not really price gouging in a, in a legal sense, that the city council chose to impose a reduction on what the food delivery services as a matter of law could charge for our purposes. Just to give you a sense, in addition to all the work I described online and in brick and mortar, we felt as though the state statute that existed redefining price gouging didn't go far enough. So in addition to all the work I'm describing, in the middle of the pandemic, we also went to the city council and got city law to change to make it easier for us to pursue price gouging for sellers who didn't offer those services before the emergency. So we're working on a lot of fronts, John, I think consistent with your goal. Okay, so what, what, there is nothing you re can really do about companies like 3M, which makes the N95 mask. If they decide 
at the wholesale level to raise their price. There's nothing we can do about that. I'm, you know, you said something very important. A defense to price gouging that a seller could raise at the local level is that their cost went up in an amount equal to what the charging, you know, the amount oh, they're charging happened. has increased. We know that's happening. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's right. That is beyond the control of my office. Last thing I do want to say, though, is you should know without, I can't get into detail, but I've also been very concerned about costs incurred by medical facilities, and we're working with one medical facility now regarding an allegation about the cost that they were incurring. So we're working on many levels at the same time, but I cannot change the cost that a national company is charging um, to local sellers. That's beyond my authority. Okay. Very good. Thanks for, thanks for your question. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, next question. If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. Yes, Guy, I will unmute you. Oh, thank you. Uh, my concern moving forward with the police, just the morale of the police with this, uh, these recent uh, incidences, uh, just hiring uh, officers. I, uh, there's good officers and there's actually bad officers, but I imagine hiring going forward is going to be just challenging. It's bad enough. Uh, I have a neighbor who moved out of Los Angeles, became a police officer. I spoke with him a couple of weeks ago. And it, it's just an interesting mindset of, of an officer who uh, has just gone into the field of uh, policing. And I, I, I'm concerned about the hiring and the pool of individuals. It's like a deterrent. I was just wondering if that's played on uh, anybody on the council uh, of just going forward, the difficulty it may be hiring uh, good officers and people wanting the job. I mean, it's a t tough job as it is. And with this last few weeks, it makes it even more challenging. I, I was just throwing it out to more like a comment. I was just wondering if there's any anything uh, trying to help to recruit individuals versus deterring them. So it's a great question. I, I can't speak for what the council members are thinking about this. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, on the one hand, all of us know that there is an urgent need to assure that there is no room in any of our institutions, especially the police department, for racism, either implicit or explicit, and that equity in the way we deliver uh, policing services has to be the rule of the day, and that excessive force has no place in law enforcement. All those principles need to be brought home at the most basic level. It is also the case that I too am concerned that because of all the events that are happening right now, that police officers who are trying their best to do a really good job every day are themselves suffering from bad morale right now. And that recruiting people who we want on the force because they want to be the kind of policing officers who we all want to respect and they want to earn the respect of the communities they serve may decide to do something else. Um, and so as we move forward as a city, we've got to both be extremely vigilant about making this the defining time where we root out racism and excessive force and at the same time, promote the values of policing that will inspire people we want to serve to be on the force. Striking that balance is gonna be extremely challenging to do, but it's absolutely necessary. Like I said before, I don't support defunding the police. I support a police force that is a part of the community it serves. And that because of the way it serves the community, earns the respect of people in neighborhoods and respects the people in the neighborhoods it serves. That's the department that I want our city to have. We've made great strides in that direction, but we still have room to go. Next question. Great. Uh, Rudy has a question. Rudy, can you unmute yourself? Yep, I did. So um, you actually came right back to what I wanted to uh, revisit, which is the idea of defunding the police, as well as you know the definition of what policing is. Um, there's one, uh, I saw one article or commentary about what defunding actually means. And it's centered around the idea that we ask police to do so many different things when they go into particular situations. And so, you know, we talk about the kind of training they receive. We talk about 
um, you know, how much is budgeted for police activity, the, the fact that they have to do so much overtime. Um, can you talk about a little bit more than just community policing and what you would see as, you know, the model for a new police department with a different budget, right? If they're not calling on, um, if they're not being asked to call when someone has a, uh, a mental illness and is acting out and, you know, being involved in that situation, then they have time to focus on, you know, different types of crime. Can you talk about what uh, a community police force would look like with a different budget and focused on different types of activities to serve the community? Yeah, you know, you said something that's really important. And that is one could envision a world where we don't rely on the police in the first instance to solve every problem that even that relates to public safety issues on our streets. Um, a lot of us think of homelessness when we think of that vision, right? Uh, where a team that's comprised of psychiatric social workers and uh, someone who is an expert in getting people the services they need is the point of first intervention and second intervention so we get somebody to where they need to be. Now, that vision is very complicated, even just when it comes to homelessness, very complicated because unfortunately our society has not devoted the resources it needs to mental health, for instance. So will there be places to which those new teams could direct folks on the street? Not right now, and that's a real issue. We don't have enough shelter space right now in our, in our city, and some of that is because neighborhoods have resisted that idea, and that's wrong. And we also have a deficient mental health system, and that causes great strains on the street because there are no places for people to go. And yet we thrust police into the middle of that situation, just to choose one example among many that you could have cited. So, yes, I do think that we should be not making law enforcement the tip of the spear when it comes to grappling with certain issues in our community. But it's also the case that there are dangerous situations which require the intervention of law enforcement. I think of a range of them. Now, it doesn't mean that police are the only ingredients in that resolution. And I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean. In South Los Angeles right now, we have a program that I started in my office. Uh, it's a program that is driven by my knowledge that kids who are exposed to violence and trauma, whether they're victims or not, will never have their brains developed the way they were biologically intended. That science is very important right now because those very kids are the kids who typically live in neighborhoods where the education opportunities are crummy, where there aren't good stores, there aren't good, there's not good food, there's not good recreation, there are often single parent families. A whole range of other problems converge on those same kids. So I, we looked at where the shots fired calls were most prevalent in Los Angeles. And we zeroed in on a neighborhood in Watts, a reporting district in Watts. Now, when there's a shots fired call, my office has organized a team of LAPD, a trained therapist, and a community activist who roll out to the scene, day or night. And they identify whether there are any kids in the neighborhood even heard about the shot and offer an immediate therapeutic intervention for those kids. We train parents, and teachers and administrators in those neighborhoods, what to look out for if their kids are experiencing signs of trauma that are, that are induced by the problems I've described, and then we offer therapy to those kids later on. Without, without belaboring the point, you can see that from my standpoint, public safety in the wake of a shots fired call means more than LAPD arriving to the scene to try to find out who the perpetrator was. It involves a community health response that my office is trying to lead. I hope that gives you some insight into how I see public safety moving forward. This could be a whole hour's discussion in itself, but I'm trying to give you some specifics as to how I believe public safety should look that includes LAPD for sure, but transcends it too. Great. Thank you, Mike. We have one more question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Joyce Feinfeld, can you uh, unmute yourself? Or I did for you. I think you did. Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, Mike. Good hi, to Joyce. see you. Um, I want to segue on what you were just talking about, actually, because um, I've been working really closely with our local police department, and actually, even recently, with the with the with, at the captain's request, started a, a booster club organization for them over the past year. And with all of this happening, 
I was a little concerned about, wow, well, how do we continue to support them while supporting the, the necessary changes that need to take place? Um, but you've given me some good answers here, I think. But I also want to point out that the um, LA has done a lot when it comes to training their police force. And um, I would recommend any people take the community police academy that is offered to community members because it talks a lot about the exact kind of training you were talking about, sending in mental health officers and um, other people. Um, what, what I really want to, to know is, again, moving forward, um, how can we, like organizations that that I just started, for example. Um, what's the best way for us to create that balance? Because I want to show support for Black Lives Matter and I want to show support for the police department. Um, but people seem so, you're either in one camp or the other. Such an important question, Joyce. And I will say at the beginning that I don't purport to have an easy answer to it. I think we need to be working on both levels simultaneously, and that may take a little space from this moment to, to evolve. Uh, part of what I'm hoping can happen is some broader community reconciliation. As you know, in the wake of the arrests of peaceful protesters, I've drawn a pretty stark contract. On the one hand, my office is now prosecuting those who we allege looted, commit an act of vandalism and violence. And we have a number of cases we're prosecuting right now because there can be no room in our city for that. On the other hand, the lion's share of those on the streets were peacefully protesting people. And in fact, as we've seen over the course of the last week or so, we've seen these protests evolve to essentially exclusively peaceful acts with none of that vandalism and looting accompanying them. So I made the decision, we're gonna prosecute those, those who engaged in acts of vandalism and looting and so forth. And on the other hand, if you were a peaceful protester whose only violation was to have been on the street um, during a curfew or uh, failed to uh, disperse when asked to, and that's it, that we're going to not prosecute you. And my office, when we decided this week to create instead, and this is where I wanna conclude the answer, a series of, I think, innovative ways to bring protester and law enforcement and community activists and business persons together for conversations that will deepen understanding and empathy and create the space for the kind of mutual respect that enables you, Joyce, to be in a situation where you can be a booster of the police and a champion for equity at the same time. Um, I'm, we're not there yet, I don't think. But that, those kinds of conversations in a meaningful way, I think are ingredients in moving forward. So I don't have like a, an ABC series of steps that I recommend you take, because I'm not sure what the answer is right now. The feelings are very raw at the moment, but I think moving forward, the way to get to where you wanna go is to create these opportunities for candid, direct exchanges where people say what they mean and ideally propose concrete suggestions. Thanks for your question. I look forward to more. I really appreciate you guys getting together with me today. Thank you, Mike. Thank, you. Thank you so much for being with us today and taking the time to answer those questions, to share your thoughts about what's, what needs to be done and to give us an idea of where we might be heading. And I'm sure you're gonna be hearing from some people afterwards about their thoughts about what might need to be done differently than, you, than you've uh, put out and congratulating any of the things that they do appreciate. Thank you for being here. We, and hey, no, feel no, free no. to stick around. We don't want you to go, but we know that you have a lot of time commitments on your hands. No, thank you very much. No, I do need to run, but with a lot of gratitude, I look forward to speaking to you all again in person very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And so the next section of the, of the meeting that we wanted to, to, to have is a, a chance for all of you to talk a little bit about your businesses and and whether you're open and if you're open how we can help you uh, and before we do that we were also using today as a special 
support your chamber restaurant day and some of you may have ordered from them for lunch and if not today because it's kind of hard to eat while you're on your zoom call and everyone's seeing you chomping away uh, tomorrow do it if not today we just want to really highlight the restaurants that are a part of the chamber right now and i just want to quickly go through them it's sixth and la brea it's black dog coffee book my lot food truck candela taco bar commerson El Coyote, 11 City Deli, Far Sully, I didn't say that right, 11 City Deli, I was going to call them the diner, they're the deli, and Farmer's Market Restaurants, Good Gracious Marketplace, Oh So Good, and Rocco's Neighborhood Pizza, please, please, please support the people who are supporting the chamber and, and participating with us in such a high level. Uh, I also wanted to take a moment just, before, just real quick, on that, um, if you, or when you do order from these restaurants, if you could just take a picture of your food or you with the food or anything else and hashtag Greater Miracle Mile Chamber or GMMTC, uh, we would love to post that online to show our support as well. And so I'm going to actually start things off and I'm, I'm going to do something a little different than what I've been requested to do because I don't want to talk about my business right now. I want to talk about what's happened in the protests and what's happened as a, as a follow up to it. And from my perspective, it's got to be at a local and a personal level how we confront racism and how we what we can do in a real way in a local way to help combat the inherent racism in our society right now and so i just want to put out to all of you if there's anybody on this call right now if there's anybody in the chamber who would like to join me uh and a small group of other folks in discussions around realistic ways of confronting internalized racism racism Con real constructive ways of combating racism on a one-to-one -one level with our friends and our colleagues and, and the people that we do business with and, and just finding ways of doing that. We're just gonna put together a little group. So if you would like to be a part of that conversation, all you have to do is email me. And I'm gonna put my email in the chat right now. But uh, what we know is that this is a moment, right? This is a sea change in the way that, that, that this country is looking at racism and recognizing that it's, it's not people in hoods. It's, 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 it's all of us participating potentially in a systemic way that we interact with, 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 with uh, our, our African American and Asian and, and Latinx and any other ish uh, group that we want to talk about, lesbian, gay, bisexual, whatever. But in this moment, we're talking about, about Black uh, lives, right? So if you want to be a part of that conversation, and I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know. But the point is to get together and start having those conversations. Email me, chuck at seeingredla.com, and we'll put, uh, we'll put a little, uh, little task force together. Thank you, Chuck. And having said that, let's hear from you about your businesses, whether you're open, and if you are open, what we can do to help support you. What are your hours? What can we do to support you? And I'm just going to get started right now with John Engel. You're at the top of my screen. Okay, well, I'm John Engel, I'm a dentist. We are open, but with very specific guidelines from the County of Los Angeles. Uh, my office has made it very clear as a team, we will not only meet, but exceed all the guidelines. Right now, we're not supposed to use Cavitrons, anything that creates aerosol. Uh, so I don't do, most of my work creates aerosol. So right now I'm seeing emergencies and I have all the PPE so I could do emergency aerosol, um, but I'm not scheduling things that are not a s emergency like that. Uh, we're taking care of new patients, we're taking care of emergencies, um, and uh, we're just here to, you know, to be the best team player in the community in a really difficult time. John, as to that, are people, uh, can people uh, call and uh, schedule an appointment for an upcoming session? Is that possible? You know what? We are still, this is, yeah, you're, you hit the nail on the head from my front desk. What can we really schedule? Because we don't know when they're going to lift the aerosol uh, requirements. Uh, so Los Angeles County has probably in the state of California, the most narrow guidelines, and we honor them. And that's, you know, uh, so, and, and we could give you an appointment for next week, 
but we may have to change it if they don't open it up. The other thing with the hygienists is they can only see half as many patients as they used to see because a lot of their work was done with hand with a, a, an electronic instrument called the Cavitron, but they have to do everything by hand, which is physically, physically so taxing for them that they can't see eight patients in a day like they used to. So we're down to four patients a day. We'll eventually get up to five or six. And as soon as they let us go full bore, we have everything set up. We have HEPA filters. We got air direction. You know, we've done everything that we could do to make it safe for you. And for the entire, everyone to know, to this date, including Germany, which changed no rules in their dental offices and did not shut down during COVID, there has not been a single transmission noted in a dental office in the world, period. So we are ahead of the curve. We're safe. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And let's move on to Kieran woodward Saro. If you want to go ahead and unmute and tell us a little bit about what we can expect from you and your business. Oh, um, well, I'm, we're selling masks and um, they're 1250 with a nose and um, they, they have like continuous patterns now. So um, my website is sarostudio.com and, um, and oh, and we're giving two masks away today um, to the chamber in the raffle. So, thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much for that. And if you could uh, just type your, that web address into the chat bar, that would be very helpful. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. We're going to move on to Rudy. Hi, Rudy. Hey, thanks, Chuck. Um, my name is Rudy Bethay. Uh, I own a farmer's agency, um, Farmers Insurance, and we've actually been open the entire time. Uh, it was pretty easy for us to convert and go back to, you know, not go back to, but start working from home because our phone systems were pretty much all we needed and, you know, the computers, of course. Um, so, John, I, I kind of feel your pain. Throughout this whole thing, we've been um, answering calls from different customers who are, you know, have had their businesses interrupted, and I've had to deliver, you know, that uncomfortable news that, you know, the insurance carriers were not, uh, you know, providing reimbursement under the business interruption clause in most of the policies. And unfortunately, to date, I still haven't found any other partner carriers. So I don't just offer farmer's insurance. I sell many different brands and none of them have really released, you know, any funds due to, to business, to COVID. And, um, you know, even as an agent, I agree. It seems to me that that would be the reason people, um, you know, purchase these policies in the first place is, is hoping that in something, in an event of something like this, they would, they would, uh, they would have protection. So, you know, I feel your pain. But at the same time, um, you know, we have been able to help some people who have had to file claims uh, as a result of looting. Um, and so we were able to honor, you know, every single claim that was filed uh, for property for property damage. Um, so we've been we've been working pretty diligently with other businesses in the community to to respond to those issues. Um, other than that, uh, we've ha we've also had to we've been doing a lot of work with homeowners and people and their car insurance, just helping them out find different ways to either you know make good on their premium payments or to find other carriers that might be more you know affordable in this time. Uh, so we've been up and busy and are here to help. If anyone has any questions, even if we don't you know offer the, the product or sell. The company that you have now happy to help you interpret you know a contract or do an analysis for you see if you might be better off somewhere else so anyway we can help thank you so much rudy and uh moving forward because we've got a lot of you have still on the call if we could try to keep it down to one minute uh as much as we love hearing everybody rudy and john uh, let's uh, go ahead and just uh, just uh, quickly go through. And Lenore, you're going to be next. And uh, what do you have to tell us? So, 
Hi there, I unmuted myself. Well, hospitality, travel, you know, has been hit really very hard. And um, people, believe it or not, are starting to slowly uh, start to travel again. Uh, but, you know, hospitality, it comes from the word hospital to care for people in hospitality in our sense of the term means treating the soul. So people are wanting to travel, but everybody's being very cautious. And so we're inventing new ways to uh, create our business in a different way, because there is no going back to what was. It's going to be totally different. And um, so here we are, and uh, we figure 2021 is going to be our year. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Lenore, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Joyce. Oh. Let's see. Am I on mute? Okay. Hi, Chuck. Thank you. Um, well, I am in, tomorrow is my last day of work, essentially, of paid labor. Um, so I am retiring from my normal activities um, and moving into other areas um, of interest. And most of those areas involve helping the community in any way I can. So um, I plan on staying involved with the chamber um, to see what opportunities there are and, and helping out in, in, uh, in whatever ways. As I said, I started the working with the police and uh, education will always be top of my list. And, um, but again, I'm totally interested in your in your discussion group, Chuck, because that's exactly where I'm headed right now. So, thank you. Thank you. We're gonna move on to Jill Brown. Hi, Jill. Hi, Chuck. Hi, everyone. So, at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, our building is still closed, but we have online programs. We have speakers every week, both Holocaust survivors and other speakers and panel discussions. But I especially want to mention um, that we have two summer workshops coming up for middle and high school students. Joyce, if you know anyone, please let them know. Mm -hmm. um, so these programs are usually held in person, but they will be online this year. Um, next week, June 15th to 19th, it's an art, a visual art workshop. And so students are going to be working with Holocaust survivors who are themselves artists, learning about their experiences and talking about how they can use art in their own lives to express themselves and find resilience in difficult situations. That's next week, um, and it's in partnership with Milken School, but it's open to any student, uh, middle school or high school. And then our second workshop is a theater workshop. It's a two-week program, July 6th to 17th, and it's in partnership with the Wallace Annenberg Center for Performing Arts. And so students will work with um, theater directors and Holocaust survivors and create a short theater piece that portrays experiences that Holocaust survivors um, experienced when they were young. And they will virtually uh, present their work through uh, the Wallace Anna Annenberg Center. And I will put a link in the chat um, to if anyone wants to sign up. Thank you for that, Jill. Excellent. It's so Thanks. good that you're in our community. We're so thrilled about that. Thank you. Elka, we're gonna we'll go to you and after that it'll be Guy. Okay, great. Um, Jill, I'm gonna actually email you because uh, my daughter has participated in the past in one of your high school programs and I have a middle schooler um, and an eighth grader who just graduated via drive-through graduation yesterday. Um, so we'll definitely love to get them both in there. Um, so thank you. My business has been, um, Really, we're focused again on Medicare, uh, Medicare enrollments. We've been helping a lot of people over the phone and via um, online enrollments. In the past, it's all been face-to-face -face mostly. And then at the end of this month, I will be doing my first virtual Medicare 101 seminar um, via Zoom as well. So that will be interesting. Um, and then something that we participated in earlier this or last at the end of last month was through um, one of the local synagogues did a flower bouquets that they were sending out to all their senior members. So um, my company Simple Horizons actually was able to co-sponsor a lot of those and the kids in the community wrote cards 
Um, and then they were all hand delivered to those seniors. So we were happy to participate in that. Um, I think everyone loves getting flowers. Um, and it, of course, if anyone ever has questions about Medicare, med retirement, um, all of that, they can shoot them my way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elka. Guy. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'm with Cressa Realty, and uh, we represent uh, occupiers, maybe office, industrial, or office. We represent uh, tenants only, a system on expansion, relocation, and renewals. And I want to have a shout out. Uh, Rudy came through the uh, Miracle Mile Chamber as a referral. That's how I became a member after all these years. And, and Rudy, I just moved him uh, from his previous location into a large Mont village. And I was grateful to give Chuck a, a referral of a, of a physician that I'm uh, currently second time uh, renewing their lease in a high rise building. So mm -hmm. if you need anybody uh, needs any requirements for renewal of their lease, I always try to tell my clients start way ahead of the time it takes a lot longer than anybody anticipates. If your lease is expiring within the 12 months, we need to, you need to start now. And I create leverage for tenants on behalf of them for landlords are bidding for their business. And some businesses are hard to relocate like this doctor I'm working with. It's established doctors and dentists don't like to relocate. But there's a lot of infrastructure that's already in place and to duplicate that it's expensive, but there's ways to create leverage with current landlords to keep those costs down. That's what I Thank you, Guy. All right, we're gonna do one more because we're, we're running out of time. I'm just going to uh, ask Marcella. Marcella, would you unmute and uh, just quickly tell us a little bit about your business hours and what you're doing? Okay, thanks. Hi guys, it's so nice to see everybody. And Wow, what wonderful speakers we had. Just real quick, uh, we're excited because uh, we have been in contact. We do the outdoor fitness program at the park. And one thing we did is we did pivot and we started offering the online Zoom classes, which has been wonderful because we now have people worldwide joining us on boot camp at different times of the day. So it's been really exciting in that regard. Uh, we are excited to get back outdoors to the park though. So we're in communication with them and uh, it may be really soon that we're gonna be out there practicing safe distancing uh, with masks and all <laughs> exercising in the park. So we're very excited about that. And one thing I just wanna leave you with a little healthy tip because I find myself doing this lately as stress starts to rise because it's stressful thinking about getting back out into the world even <laughs> you know there's a lot to it but to just be aware of your unconscious eating habits that might be happening you know it's if it's there you're going to start reaching for it and try and get on a schedule of your eating so that you you get that little piece under control because it can happen real fast that all of a sudden you're like I didn't even taste what I ate so I just want to encourage you all to be healthy stay safe and stay informed thank you I'm not calling it the COVID-19, I'm calling it the COVID-20. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the 20 pounds? I've been, I've been eating. We can I've take care of that. Bit. It's okay, don't stress over that. No. It'll go away. But, but, but something needs to be done. Anyways, <laughs> well, uh, I'm so sorry we didn't get to everybody, but we do want to get to the raffle. So I want to talk to Meg really quick. Meg, what's first up on our raffle? We just need to unmute Meg. Unmute. There we go. Not hearing you yet. Meg, you don't touch anything. Chris, unmute her. I'm working on it. There we go. Thanks. Hello. Hi, What's everybody. the first thing on our list? Yes. Well, uh, I have, let's go for Karen's two face masks. And they're really cool. They're gorgeous. So, uh, Chris, are you going to let that... Um, Electronic spin, Perfect. go. And, yeah, and it's uh, Michelle Mena. Aha, excellent, excellent. Congratulations, Michelle, you're gonna- you. I, I never win anything. <laughs> yes, you do, you can never say that again. You do. That's right. Okay. Excellent, and, um, and thank you so much, Karen, for donating those. Yeah, all right, and next, next up is Fanciful 
find food in baskets is going to give a gift certificate. They haven't indicated how much, but whatever size basket you get with these guys is fabulous. So for a fanciful fine food basket, Chris, take it away. Up for your retirement, Joyce. Joyce Kleinfeld. Yay! Yay! Excellent. And thank All you, right. Wally and Terry August, for doing that. All right. And from Kramer Law Group, we've got a healthcare directive, which is transferable. All right. That would be Ying Vida. Okay. Hi, Ying. Wherever you are. Is Ying still here? Is yeah. Still here? Oh, I'm not seeing her. Uh oh. Uh oh. Another spin, please. Okay. Draw it again here. I'm back. Did I win anything? Not yet. <laughs> oh, Mariko. Erica. Mariko. Oh, Mariko. Oh, Mariko. Oh, hey, is Mariko still here? She is not no. on the call. She was for a time, but not. No. Now. Spin again. Spinning again. Let's spin the wheel. Erica Pressburg. Erica Pressburg. Erica's gone. Spin okay. again. Here we go. All right. Karen Sorrow. All right. Yay. Yay. Okay. From Urban Florist, a fabulous and ever gorgeous arrangement. So give it a spin. Kimberly Morrissey, Barossi. I'm not hearing the name. Uh, Kimberly Morosi. Kimberly Morosi, she's gone. All right, spin again. Boy, she gonna miss out. Oh, I'm gonna butcher this name. I apologize in advance. Alan, say, Ganian. Uh, Alan's not here. Okay. Spin again. <laughs> Marcella wants it. Jill Brown. Is Jill here? Hey. 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 Right. Excellent. And is that the final one? Oh, no. We got more. But right. wait, there's more. What's From next? Nutmeg, a fabulous wooden jigsaw puzzle. You've already got one. I did it already. Uh, well, okay. Eva Kim. Is Eva Kim still on the line? Who? Eva. Eva Kim. Eva Kim is not here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Evan Thomas. Evan's gone. Oops. Okay. Lisa Barnett. Yes. Hi, Lisa. Lisa. Hey. All right. Pays to stick around. It sure does. Okay. Dr. John from Southern California Dental, a new patient exam with x-rays. Wow. Jane Gilman. Jane, you here? Jane's gone. Jane's gone. Okay. Then again. Come on, Marcella. Win it. You need it. You want it. <laughs> Guy Eisner. <laughs> right on. Guy? Congratulations, Guy. Okay. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you. Okay, and the last one is from Good Gracious Events, a selection of their savory pies. Uh -huh. Delicious. They are. Uh, Christy Tarpley. All right. Woohoo! <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you for those who donated, and thank you to those who won. Yay! All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Chris, again, for your outstanding uh, uh, technical abilities and keeping us on track. Meg, you did an outstanding job putting everything together once again. And uh, I just want to thank, take a moment and thank our, our, uh, the, the chair of the, the board, uh, Steve Kramer, for always, always, always supporting all the efforts and making everything happen. You have no idea what he does behind the scenes. It's constant, and it's consistent, and it's persistent. And I'm just so thankful for him. All right. You want a listing? Yeah. Anyways, that aside, 
We'll see you next month. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Got it. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Great job. Indeed. Okay. Mm.